<laughs> right, you're live. Right, wait, where are you going? <laughs> All right. I can Good morning, still hear, everyone. Zoe. Good morning, everyone. I can see the number of, there you are. I can see their numbers are popping up over here very quickly. We'll give a few minutes before we get started. I think we're a couple minutes before 10. <clears throat> and I think Mel said we had about 98 that were registered, so. I think we'll give it another minute or two in case we do have another 50 people that are planning on signing in. Hello, Erica. Welcome to everyone who's still signing on. We still seem to have a few folks coming. All right. It is just about a minute or two past 10. So I'm gonna get us started so that we can take advantage of all of our time. Um, but I want to first say welcome to all of you, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have um, all of you present on our, our call today, our webinar. And my name is McKaylee Glennon. I'm the Science Director for the Adirondack Watershed Institute here at Paul Smith College. And I was asked by Mel Johnson, who's the President of the Adirondack Research Consortium, to help organize today's panel on science and policy. In the Adirondacks. And so this is the first of a series of panels. These will be each Friday during the month of October um, around key environmental and policy issues facing the Adirondacks and its communities. And of course, we wouldn't expect anything less from the Adirondack Research Consortium. And so I'm, I'm so excited to have you here today. And I also want to welcome you and encourage you to join us for the rest of the, uh, of the month. And this will be every Friday, same time, 10 to 11 a.m. Um, for three more after this. Uh, and you can find information on the details of those right on the adkresearch.org website. Uh, the next one will be Current Stressors to Adirondack Water next week, um, Cultural Geography of the Adirondacks on October 23rd, and then the last one on October 30th will be Forest Policy. So I hope that you'll all consider joining us um, for the rest of them as well. Um, I wanna quickly thank Paul Smith College for co-hosting the event and also the Resilience Studies Consortium, International Paper and the Colgate University Upstate Institute for providing support um, in the midst of this 
pandemic that we're in where we're all farther apart than we would like to be. It's, it's terrific to have the support of you here with us virtually. Um, if you are so inclined and in a position to do so, uh, the ARC would of course also welcome financial support so that it can continue to bring us programming like this. And you can do that too, right through the website through adkresearch.org. And I think we can probably put that website right into the, uh, the chat box so you can see that. Um, I'll just give two minutes of, of background on, on the, the platform here. Uh, just in case before we get into the programming. Um, it's hard to imagine that there are folks out there that haven't now been on a, a Zoom meeting or multiple Zoom meetings. Probably we all have, uh, but just in case, I will, I will mention that um, there are some, some basics to this process. Um, we're going to do some introductory remarks from our two panelists initially, and then we'll get into the ask the experts part of this ask, ask the experts panel. And so you can submit your questions through the Q&A box, which should be, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, should show up a little uh, icon that shows Q&A. And so you can input those questions there at any time. And we can, uh, we can look at those uh, throughout, the, throughout the webinar, and, but you can type them in at any point that you would like to. If for some reason that doesn't work, the chat box uh, is another option that's also at the bottom of your screen. If you are on an iPad or possibly a Chromebook, those icons might be located somewhere else, um, but they should be somewhere where you are able to find them. So please feel free to, to chat to us for whatever reason you'd like, um, but also to use the Q&A to submit your questions if you'd like. We also have some questions that were submitted ahead of time. Um, that we're going to try to focus on as well. So we'll monitor both the Q&A and the chat box. Uh, we can't see you or hear you, <laughs> so don't worry about muting yourself. We've, we've got that set, um, but we can, we can respond to you if you need us. Um, you can't see her, but I do have Zoe Smith um, is here with us, and she's thankfully helping <laughs> with all of this technology that I would be a disaster at managing. So if you have um, some some technical problems and, and really this isn't working for you, please uh, reach out through the chat box to Zoe or raise your hand. Um, I think she could maybe, Zoe, you could put your email down there in the chat box too, if for some reason you've got trouble with all of this and, and we'll get you straightened out there. Um, and last, I'll just mention that this is being recorded. It's also, I believe, being streamed live on Facebook. So this is my first live Facebook stream. <laughs> Um, so there'll be an opportunity to get back to the material later on, um, if any of you would like to do that. So I'm going to briefly introduce our two panelists, and then I'm going to ask them to provide a few minutes of remarks, um, and then we'll get into the, the questions after that. Um, I've probably broken some sort of golden rule of panels by only having two panelists, um, but that's because I have the best panelists. <laughs> And when I was speaking with folks trying to, to gather some thoughts on who to invite to this panel, um, you know, it was really easy. Some names rose to the top right away and it was really easy to do that. And, and in the interest of, of having time to really get into the discussion part of this, um, particularly because I know we have a lot of students here who welcome the opportunity to talk with, with professionals. Um, I'm, I went with two and, and so we have today with us um, two folks that I'm, I'm really excited and, and happy to have. Um, one of them is Jess Otney Mahar, and Jess is the New York Director of Policy and Strategy for the Nature Conservancy, and she was instrumental in passing the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, the Conservancy, as we all know, is, is a champion of land protection in the Adirondacks and beyond, um, and in her capacity as Policy Director, at TNC, Jess has led efforts in support of the enactment of laws and regulations to protect and restore natural resources and secure um, lots of public funding for environmental conservation. She also oversees the Conservancy's involvement in partnerships in New York that support national level policy priorities and has more than 15 years of experience in environmental and conservation policy and advocacy. And she was absolutely <laughs> one of the people that was suggested to me by numerous folks of you know, who would be a good person to talk about um, science and policy. Um, our second panelist is Peter Howell. You will notice if you know Peter um, or if you know Kim Elliman that Kit, that is not Kim Elliman. We have Peter Howell today with us. Um, Kim Elliman had, 
ag agreed to be on the panel and but also was very honest with me right from the start that he might need to be uh, at the Lake Minnewaska Visitor Center opening, which is a great um, celebratory event for OSI. And so of course we are absolutely understanding of that. And I joked with him on email yesterday that it wouldn't be an ARC event without at least one panelist whose last minute schedule was dependent on the whims of the governor. Um, but thankfully, Peter uh, has, has been willing to step in and, and we appreciate that very much. Um, Peter is also from OSI. He's the Executive Vice President for Conservation Capital and Research Programs. And OSI, um, if you don't know them, is, is again a, a huge player in land protection um, in New York and beyond. Eastern United States have protected more than 2 million acres um, by a combination of land acquisition, funding, research, and advocacy. And the Adirondacks has been um, a very important recipient of those efforts and a, and a great beneficiary um, of some tracks that have gotten into our forest preserve, including the largest ever um, piece added to the forest preserve in the form of the former Finch Pine Lands. Um, so Peter has graciously agreed to be here today. Um, and he, prior to his role at OSI, uh, served as the program director for environment at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, overseeing distribution of funding for land conservation in the US. Um, he's also worked as a program officer at Wallace Funds and was associate director of public affairs and development at Sobro, an economic development corporation in the South Bronx. Um, Peter is closely involved with the climate resilience and watershed protection work that goes on at OSI, both of which are, are strongly grounded in science. And so I look forward to hearing um, from him as well. I just wanna mention sort of on a personal note that both of these organizations are heavily involved in, in what I would consider to be some of the best science that I've seen in the last decade around climate change um, and, and sort of how that ought to influence policy. And that's the resilience work, which has been developed, disseminated, supported, um, and implemented by, by some tremendous efforts on behalf of both of these organizations. And, and if ever there, there was science that I hope is influencing policy, it would, it would be that work. So I'm, I'm thrilled to have both of them here uh, to talk about this issue. So I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists now and, and offer each of them an opportunity to give us a few minutes of remarks about themselves uh, and their positions and any sort of knowledge they'd like to impart on us at a general level before we get into the more specific Q&A that we're gonna talk about. So Jess, let's start with you. Thank you so much, um, Amy, and thank you for inviting me and the Nature Conservancy to be here. Thanks to Paul Smith and the Adirondack Research Consortium. Um, it's a real thrill to be with this group today. Um, I don't want to talk about myself or my position um, because you did an overly generous job of doing that. Um, I did want to tell a story um, because, um, you know, using science to inform policy, I think is important. And it's one of the reasons I'm at the Nature Conservancy. Um, and science is really how we understand um, what issues we need to advocate on, what problems we need to solve, and it can help us inform solutions. Science isn't the solution itself, um, but it can often help us understand what actions are needed and understand whether those actions are effective. So I wanted to give an example, and unfortunately it's not an Adirondack example or a climate change example, but it's a good example. Um, so I hope you, you understand why I'm using it. Um, we started out um, as was what was discussed as a land conservation organization, and we've really um, become more than that. Um, and um, we used to, you know, buy land and be happy that we saved a great place, and we still are. That's a good thing to do, um, but we have also gotten a lot into, and, and most land trusts are now, into restoring um, the natural resources on those lands, um, making sure that the species or systems that are on those lands um, have what they need to survive and are not degraded. Um, and, you know, there's lots of reasons for why restoration is needed. Um, we did our first underwater land deal uh, when we received the Blue Points bottomlands in the Great South Bay off of Long Island. Um, it was an iconic place, much like the Adirondacks is iconic for its forests um, and waterways. This was an iconic place for shell fishing in America, um, and it was one of the places with the finest oyster beds on the East Coast for generations. So in 2002, the Blue Points 
um, company gave us 11,000 acres. Um, they're basically their estate. Um, and we called it at the time in all the national media outlets, the next frontier of land conservation. Um, and they gave it to us because the oysters weren't growing anymore. Um, if they had been making a huge profit off of those bottomlands, we probably would have never gotten uh, those donated to us. But after getting the property, we set out um, with a team of our scientists and scientists from SUNY Stony Brook and other local academic institutions, as well as the local town of Brookhaven, where the bottomlands were located, to create a recovery plan for the bay um, with an eye towards reopening those oyster and clam beds and restoring the eelgrass, the seagrass in the region. Um, and we embarked on a scientific study to understand what was going on. And a year later, we're, we released some shocking science, which was these bottomlands were um, were absolutely collapsed. The, the habitat and the species were just devastated, more so than even in the surrounding areas. And this really cast a lot of doubt on whether we could restore the Harchow clam population and the eelgrass, which was once plentiful. And the theory was if we put big clams back, they would release a lot of larva and it would be enough to survive. So we tried it. We started throwing the clams in the water. Um, and unfortunately, the clams were dying. Um, so after, and I always tell this story like a lobbyist, not like a scientist, and our scientists shudder, but after throwing these clams to their death for several years, um, we did more science to understand what was wrong. And what we realized was going on was that the water quality was too poor to support um, hard shell clam populations. Um, and then we had to figure out why, you know, what was in the water that was the problem. And it turned out it was nitrogen pollution. Um, and then we had to figure out, well, where is this coming from? There were lots of theories about where it might be coming from. Was it acid rain? Was it runoff pollution? It turns out it's from sewage. So now this is getting a, into a really attractive story. Um, but it turns out that um, septic systems on Long Island and Suffolk County, and then one really big sewage treatment plant um, to the west, were putting so much nitrogen into the Great South Bay that it was just an inhospitable environment for shellfish. Um, and you know where this story took us is not only on this scientific journey, but also on a journey as an organization um, where we shifted our entire regional program into working on water quality. And then as a region where we used science, that finding about nitrogen and its source, and also social science, polling, focus groups, to understand um, where we could go with the people of Long Island to fix this problem of too much nitrogen in the water. And we um, embarked on really focusing on this problem, solving this problem in a way that people could understand. We had to do a lot of public education. We had to help people understand why there was too much nitrogen in their water and what it meant for them as a people. Much like the Adirondacks, um, Long Island is deeply, deeply connected to natural resources, both for recreation and for economy um, and so um, and public health and so we had to educate the public and policymakers about the impact of this nitrogen pollution in the water and now we're at a point where this week the suffolk county legislature just voted to require um, advanced septic systems that remove nitrogen pollution to be installed in every new construction and every major renovation when that's happening in Suffolk County to a building. So we went from, uh-oh, the fish and the oysters and the clams aren't here anymore, all the way to, we know exactly why our fish are dying and our bays are having red tide and our shellfish won't return. And now we're taking action to do something about it and putting major policy and funding in place to bridge that gap so that people can afford the technologies they need uh, to restore uh, water quality on Long Island. So, you know, that is the story of how science can show you where to go. You start somewhere, you start saving a place, and you end up working to enact policy that might be completely unrelated to the initial, um, you know, purchase of a place or, um, or, or initial mission, but it's what you need to make that place sustainable. That's great. That's a great story. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about that spot. <laughs> Peter, you're muted. There you go. <laughs> so um, following Jess is not easy. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Good. So following Jess is not easy and what a masterful description of how thoughtfully TNC uses science, the challenges and opportunities, um, and the kind of organic iterative methodology that's required. It's a real testament to um, that organization uh, with whom we're very, very pleased to partner. Um, I'm not a scientist at the outset. I'm trained in the humanities uh, with an MBA, but I've been fortunate through my work in philanthropy and at OSI over the past 18 years to sit at the feet of some really impressive scientists um, and to have worked uh, with them in translating science to guide some of the land protection work we've done. We've also worked with uh, Michele, Zoe, and, and um, Heidi, and uh, it was terrific to revisit some of the work that they've done uh, in the Adirondacks. Um, two areas that Michele referred to that we work on in particular are watershed science uh, and resilience. I'll talk a little bit about the resilience um, in a bit. Um, but let me just um, do three things. I wanna touch a few reflections on the general theme of science informing policy. Wanted to address a little bit some of the successes and failures um, of where that happens. Um, so the Adirondacks, which is where you all work and are studying, uh, is such a fascinating laboratory and it does provide us with a great perspective on how and under what conditions science can drive policy. Um, it's unique, you all know, public and private lands at multiple levels of management. Um, you can often find conflicts, as we all know, between uh, human use and the science. Um, and science has evolved in, in the Adirondacks. You know, in the beginning, um, you know, in the 1890s, really, 1980s to 90s, we, we really learned, leaned toward large scale land holdings with purely biodiversity in mind. And increasingly, we're looking at trends toward recreational use and eventually how do we manage for climate and, and the science and management um, need to change. Um, in, in some ways, the science has shifted. We're, we're seeing a trend more toward biocentric, um, from biocentric toward more um, anthropocentric um, uh, and moving us perhaps away from science on some level. And yet at the same time, science is getting um, a lot better. It's getting more fine grain and finer resolution. Um, it's um, also more holistic. Um, and so uh, in, because of the increasing comprehensiveness and accessibility of science and scientific data, it's becoming harder and harder for policymakers to avoid science and, and we're, we're able to apply it in unique ways. And don't need to tell you this, but at a global level, the world has changed so radically, even in the last 10, 15 years that I've been working in the field, some examples, we have amazing amounts of data about the location of imperiled species. Uh, with over four decades of collection, we know a million mapped locations of species. It's all online, it's all mappable. We have data on carbon, on migration patterns of birds, thanks to eBird and the work of, of many conservation scientists. We got incredible real-time data about um, sea level rise and models that uh, from places like surging seas. We've got wall-to-wall -wall data across the U.S. on ecological resilience developed by Mark Anderson at TNC. Um, but this is just data. And to guide um, uh, policy, as Zoe McKelly and Heidi's work in are shown, and certainly as, as um, Jess just pointed out, it needs to be uh, applied regionally. It needs to be robust, accessible, and you, you need to communicate about it. Uh, in concrete, practical ways. So uh, if time affords, I just wanted to give one or two thoughts just on some of the questions that uh, were posed to us about where does science succeed? Well, Jess gave a great example, <laughs> but one of the best examples in my mind that perhaps you've all have studied is around acid rain. This is probably one of the most successful examples of uh, using science to drive policy in the nation, maybe the world. And you may be uh, familiar with some of the long-term term watershed um, modeling and sampling work done by Hubbard Brook in New Hampshire, but this painstaking work on the effects of acid rain led to scientific consensus and subsequently had a tremendous impact driving national policy reform that manifested itself in the Clean Air Act amendments um, that greatly reduced acid precipitation in the Adirondacks and really has led to a revival of woods and waters there and elsewhere in, in uh, the northern forest. 
You know, water is another place where I think science has had a pretty interesting impact. I, I think you're going to talk about that next week, so I won't, I won't uh, say a lot about that. But um, we've done a fair amount of work on this. Um, we have done some literature reviews and are commissioning a major a scientific assessment of the effects of land, of the contribution of land protection to water quality in the Delaware watershed. And we all know that forests contribute to water quality. And we generally know that if you get a watershed 60 to 90% and keep it in forest cover, that it'll keep the water clean. But it's so variable and that's a big range. And we wanna know in a more fine grained way What's the tipping point in, in, a, in a watershed for when you do lose forest cover, water quality starts to decline? And so we're doing a mix of modeling and monitoring to try to get at that answer. And it is the kind of science that could be very practical and utilized by everyone from water utilities to land protection agencies that are funding uh, land protection for water quality. So this is the kind of very grounded concrete um, work we think it, it, not yet, but we think it could have um, uh, impact um, on policy. One thing I want to point out that I think uh, where there's been a lot of challenges in applying science is around fire. And we don't have any comprehensive policy to deal with fire and fuels. Now, admittedly, this is an issue more in the West than it is in the Adirondacks and the East. But there's a huge amount of evidence that's been, scientific evidence but that's been developed. But but um, we still have a policies that focus on fuels and fire uh, suppression, not on a holistic approach toward forest man management. And I think some of the challenges here um, certainly are that, that um, you know, fire policy depends so much on specific forests and specific regions, and it's hard to come up with generalized conclusions. Um, uh, that's certainly one challenge that we've had. Um, a lot of fire policy focuses on restoration um, and not so much on, on, on prevention, and that's been a challenge. Um, I should also stress that one of the significant barriers to changing fire policy is exurban development it, it itself, which has impeded the application of controlled burns and has actually developed a, a contrary constituation against fire management in, in many regions across the West. Um, so those are a, a couple of thoughts. Um, the uh, resilient science that um, uh, that Michele mentioned at the top uh, is something I can go into in a little more detail. Uh, it's groundbreaking analysis that has moved us away from the notion that species themselves ought to be the focus of our conservation. And instead, it's geology and patterns and landforms that guide um, which places and which species will remain resilient over time, given the shocks of climate change, of, of, um, of increased precipitation and warming. And this, this data um, has begun to seep into various state agencies, thanks to TNC's terrific work. Um, and we've been very involved in the East in helping to educate land trusts about this science, to incorporate it into their land conservation planning. As I said before, this data is now wall to wall. It's at a national level, thanks to TNC's pioneering work. And I think we're on the cusp of, of beginning to make some significant changes, specifically in elevating the importance of natural climate solutions and how we manage and uh, care for land um, protect and manage land and how that can contribute to both facilitating wildlife adaptation to climate change, but also in sequestering carbon that actually takes emissions out of the air and contributes to mitigation itself, not just um, adaptation. I think I'll leave it at that for now. Um, there's a lot more to be said about the resilient science, but hopefully that's a little bit to chew on and I look forward to your questions and uh, thoughts. Thanks. That's great, Peter. Thank you. And I'm I'm expected that the resilience would go <laughs> continent wide. I'm not surprised to hear that, but I'm excited to hear that. Of course, it's been in the Northeast was the pioneer, so I've had access to those data for a while now. But um, but that that's wonderful to know. Um, so so we're going to go into our ask the experts piece of this now. And and as as mentioned, I do have some questions that were submitted ahead of time. Um, and I'll, I'll start with some of those, but I also uh, want to encourage you to add questions in the, in the Q&A box anytime that you'd like to. Um, and I think we're getting some of those already in there. I think there might be a few that went into the chat box as well. So we can look at all of those. 
Um, I want to start, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a page from Jess and start just by with a quick story <laughs> that leads into my first question. And I think this may be relevant perhaps to some of the students that might be on the call. And, and the story is that when I was um, growing up in the Adirondacks, when I was in high school, we had to do, so I don't remember what the exact name of the assignment was, but something where we had to go out in the community and, and get involved and you know, experience some Adirondack type of you know job or, or experience and I went with my father to two days of park agency meetings he was the director at the time wow. and I sat through two days of listening to um, board members and others debate what we ought to do about milfoil I think of this as the milfoil era in my mind although the milfoil era is, is unending as I now know much better than I did then um, and it was fascinating to sit there and listen to but I can so clearly remember at that time as a high school, you know, 16 year old or whatever I was thinking like, this is great. And I would never want to be one of those board members who has to make these decisions. But God, wouldn't it be so much fun to be the scientist who gets to go out and sort of figure out whatever we need to know about milfoil. And so that's the path that I took. But I think I went into it very much thinking somehow magically if you go and collect the data, it will just lead to the policy. And I've been learning now for 20 years that <laughs> that's not at all how it works and it's not that easy. So one of the, one of the questions that was submitted ahead of time um, for you and, and either of you could take this, but is what do you think is the best way for scientists to get involved in impacting policy? Understanding that we all have different personalities and approaches and, and sort of what are the most, the, the keys of, of actually getting it from that science into something that could one day be implemented, knowing it's a really complicated process? Go on, Chess. No, oh, but you unmuted so quickly. I, I'll, I'll defer to you. Uh, so, you know, I think I love your story, McKaylee, because um, I started out working as an intern in a legislative office and quickly realized perhaps that wasn't the way I wanted to uh, spend my time and uh, linked up with an advocacy organization, which is where I, I got, got into what I do now. Um, so I, I relate a lot to your story. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of different ways that scientists can get involved in impacting policy. Um, you know, we have a strong bench of scientists in the Adirondacks, including at Paul Smith's. Um, I think of people like Dan Kelting, who um, joins me and others in meetings with policymakers about issues related to invasive species or water pollution, um, and really, you know, helps um, policymakers understand what's happening on the ground um, in the region. Um, so I think for scientists um, who are working um, you know, at an institution, whether it's an academic institution or a research institution, um, you know, finding ways to join uh, the folks that are going to meetings with legislators to help educate them about, uh, about the science is great. Um, I also think there have been scientists that transition into um, working as conservation leaders. So, you know, I work with a number of amazing scientists at the Nature Conservancy, um, one of them being um, Dr. Becca Benner, who is my partner. Um, so we have science and policy kind of together leading our work in New York on the conservation side. And um, it's fascinating to watch her mind work and think about, you know, where we should go as an organization in New York State. Um, we're kind of like the odd couple, um, but being paired with someone like that is really great. So getting into um, the conservation and not-for-profit arena where you can you know, bring your scientific knowledge and, and way of thinking to collaborate with others from other fields is another exciting way I think scientists can impact policy. And, um, and then I think, you know, it's great when scientists um, join campaigns and, um, you know, try something new. So I know a lot of, you know, reformed scientists, reformed lawyers, reformed lobbyists who move around into different fields through you know an interest area it could be the environment or it could be another area where um, people are doing science um, and transition into something else there's a lot of social scientists that work in fields related to um, you know just different policy areas defense um, in 
social justice. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities to continue just doing the science and representing that to policymakers, but then also in kind of stretching oneself and trying out new fields of work in uh, different sectors. That was great. I, uh, from my perspective, I think um, one of the most important things is to follow your passion as a scientist, wherever it may lead you, and be courageous enough to go where it goes. If you have a particular interest in policy and in real world problem solving, of course, that may mean making some choices and during, doing certain kinds of work and being more attuned to science that has more direct or near term implications on policy. The people at Hubbard Brook, they kept doing what they were doing because they didn't know anything else to do. They loved what they did, tromping around a watershed, taking samples, but they also realized over time that that data, the accumulation of that data over time began to have a kind of um, uh, validity and uh, there was a compelling nature to the data that they, they were collecting. So you can do long-term research, you can get involved in advocacy, um, but I think it, it kind of it depends what your inclination is. But one thing that's clear is that if you do want to get involved in policy, you have to be prepared for the messiness of the world. You know, that as a scientist, things won't always be black and white in the policy world. And, and that's actually been a real challenge. I remember the Packard Foundation developed this whole Leopold Loeb, a Leopold Scholars Program that was trying to educate scientists how to testify before Congress. And it was very difficult for scientists because they go on the one hand, on the other hand, no, I wanna qualify that. And teaching them to be very direct and assertive and to simplify is kind of hard for the scientific mind. So be prepared for relativism and, and messiness if you wade into that world. <laughs> that's, that's very good advice. I'm, I'm um, immediately going off my plan because some great questions are coming in from the Q&A in addition to the ones we had ahead of time. So one of these that just came from, from Stephen Bird, who's at Clarkson, um, I liked Peter's discussion of the variation in different ecosystems. How do we think about and or incorporate indigenous knowledge into environmental research and science when we're thinking about these areas and their specific context, do your organizations partner with indigenous groups for their input? Oh my God, I, I mean, such an amazing question. I mean, we are just like, like pulling our hair out trying to, to, to deal with this. A colleague of mine in Maine is participating in this thing called First Light, which some of you may have heard of, that is collaborating with indigenous peoples and tribes in Maine to think about conservation issues. And you know, the first thing that it involves is understanding there's a separate way of knowing, you know, that just the notion of science that we've developed through our kind of Western ways of thinking is very different in some ways. There are similarities, but the Wabanaki, for example, who we're working with, or the Pequati tribes up in Maine, you know, the first place they start is, well, here's our science. You know, here's how we know what we know. And it's very different than the scientific method in some ways. So we're beginning to work with those groups. I forget the name of the question. And it, it starts with understanding how they use the land, how they relate to the land, what values they have, they have for the land, how they understand the land's health, what are, you know, what are their measures or indices of health, which are similar but can differ from ours in some ways, their notions of stewardship. So um, you know, we're trying to figure out ways we can work with indigenous peoples through this new climate fund that we're creating that could um, um, purchase or give access to indigenous people for cultural or religious rights or celebrations. That's a large part of their interest in the land. Um, so it, it involves relaxing our science in some ways, like we want to use the climate science that TNZ's developed to say, oh, protect this piece of land. Well, indigenous people, when they become part of that discussion, they use a different kind of methodology and knowing to say what are the important places that they want to see protected or have access to. So it does represent some real challenges to our very science-driven approach to land protection. And that, I, you know, I could talk forever about that. I should let Jess weigh in um, with thoughts too. That was an amazing start to an important discussion, Peter, and, um, you know, yes to all of that. So, um, much like OSI, the Nature Conservancy is um, 
working with and thinking about how to work more with um, indigenous people. Um, and, you know, all of what Peter said is so important about approach and um, values and, um, you know, the way of knowing. I love the way you put that. Um, so, you know, certainly this is at the forefront of our minds as we plan our work going forward. Um, and we recently did a large um, project um, in Canada where um, work with the indigenous people of that entire region was core to um, the project and the, the future stewardship of those lands. And so um, I think there's an increasing um, awareness in the conservation community that this is very important work um, and that there are communities of people who um, have long been stewarding lands effectively um, and need access back to those lands and we need to play an active role and build relationships to ensure that those things happen. I'm gonna transition to, um, I've got some great questions. I'm gonna save the one from Ross for a minute because um, it's, it's a challenging one. Um, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna transition to a couple of questions that are um, more relevant toward our student uh, attendees. And this one is one that, uh, that I personally have gotten on, on numerous occasions recently, and I'm not sure that I'm gonna phrase it well, but I wanna add a little bit. Um, the question from Madison Franco is what, would you recommend studying in college if you wanna go into policy making? Is it environmental science or is it something more specific? And I'll just add to that, I had a friend reach out to me lately whose daughter is headed to college asking, you know, my daughter is into environmental everything. <laughs> How do I help her understand what the opportunities are um, among the various ways that you can be involved in environmental policy from science to jobs that are more like what both of you do. So would you, would you offer some thoughts on that, either of you? Um, that, you know, it's funny, I'm actually old enough now that that's a hard question to answer because the world is so different than when I started out. Um, so I'll start by acknowledging that. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to go about um, getting into, you know, policy work related to the environment. There's a lot of different tracks you can take. Um, you know, I, I studied English and political science. I did pre-law and then was one of those people who was like, I'm not doing law school. Um, and I got into working on environmental um, issues because it was my passion. Um, and, you know, because I had done enough study as an undergrad with science courses, um, I realized I can understand this stuff, you know, and these problems that I care about, I can kind of understand what the solutions could be. And I can talk to scientists and usually understand two thirds of what they're saying. Um, and then I got into um, policy through the work I did as, you know, a political science um, major and I really, it's through the, the work experience. So I started out doing an internship with a legislator um, and kind of spread my wings from there. I, I met an organization, a statewide environmental organization through that internship um, and ended up taking a job with them out of college. My parents were like, what are you doing? You're crazy. Um, my husband um, who works for DEC now, um, he was an environmental science major um, and he started out in the not-for-profit world. He started out at Audubon um, after doing an internship there um, while he was in college studying environmental science. So I think, you know, you can focus on the environmental science piece of it and obviously having information um, and a background in those issues helps, right? Um, but you can also start out from the policy side of things and think about what really gets you excited. I mean, obviously people here today are excited about the environment, but you might also want to work on you know, a different set of issues, public health issues, for example, there's a lot of overlap there. So you can use, use your schooling to explore what you're passionate about, and then you can use work experiences to figure out what you want to do every day about those things. I say be like Jess. That's a great, great background. Um, I think, I think if, if, if you've got science chops and interests, pursue them. But if you want to leaven it with some policy work, then take some political science or, you know, take a public policy course. Just, you know, broaden yourself a little bit. And that may happen in college. 
may happen after college. I mean, I studied medieval literature, philosophy, and in college, and I didn't think about any of these things. And I was a newspaper reporter for many years. So sometimes it comes later in life, but but being able to ride, you know, both horses there to know that enough about the technical stuff that you 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 understand it, you're grounded. But to understand policy and politics and process is really an important part to have to end up where Jess did. You know, if she were just a technically proficient, she wouldn't be doing the work that she's doing. She's she has this ability to understand process and politics and people and dynamics uh, that are you know not scientific in nature. So it's a real interesting meshing of kind of two two sides of your brain if you want to do this, but. My suggestion is you can come in strong policy and add um, some environment. You can come in strong environment, add some policy. The exact mix will depend on who you are, but the mix is key. I'll also just really quickly add, I, because I've worked with a lot of interns over the years who came from like a policy major and we take them down to the Capitol, you know, at the end of session or during the budget and they're like, what is this? <laughs> right? So I'll just say that, um, you know, Understanding process through study is very different than understanding how to apply um, different techniques and advocacy. And um, really, I think in, in, in my field of advocacy for policy, you know, for a specific issue like the environment, the, the biggest way someone learns and becomes an expert is by doing. And I'm still, I still half the time, I'm like, are, what are we doing? this year because it's different every day it's different every year and it's a lot about gut and instinct and intuition and experience and and losing a lot and figuring out what happened and then trying again so you know a scientist would call it like adaptive management or iterative learning um, there's a lot of iterative learning that goes on in working in policy and you really have to find a place where you can have mentors um, and have people who can explain process to you and help you learn, you know, your kind of flavor of advocacy, because that's also a big issue. It's very different depending on who you are um, and who you work for. And you have to figure out where you're most comfortable in this arena. I'm going to go to a question now from Ross Whaley, the, the, the always very, very thoughtful Ross Whaley who is guaranteed to give us a tough one. Um, and that is how does the regulator deal with the notion that everyone seems to agree that decisions should be driven, science driven, but then the activist wants to use that science in a selective way. So you might be right, but only partially right. <laughs> and this is one that comes up in the Adirondacks, I think all the time. <laughs> Thanks, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a good question, though. Um, you know, I've, I've never been a regulator, so I'll just say, you know, I, it would be interesting to have um, someone who's been in this exact position answer this question. Um, but my hunch is that, you know, one of the great things about, I believe, New York State government, regardless of the administration, but we have amazing agencies that work on environmental issues in New York, and they are full of incredibly dedicated professionals, you know, APA, DEC, um, and others. And um, they themselves also have a lot of really smart scientists on their teams. So from a regulator's standpoint, um, I think it's important that they want to use the science and it's important that they hear new science from advocates. I think um, they can kind of suss out when someone is only using half the story or trying to wield science in a really biased way. Um, they're smart. Um, I think in the environmental field, um, we've, we have really important laws and regulations in New York. Of course, we can be doing more. Um, but I think that um, at the end of the day, probably if you're coming down where everyone's a little uncomfortable, you've done a great job um, <laughs> when you're crafting regulations. So, you know, I think there's a willingness to take in new information and new science. Um, I think there's a, a awareness of when science is being kind of bent into shaping something from a perspective that, that's going too far. And I think there's usually 
um, an opportunity to get a win in there for most of the crowd. Yeah, I'd only add to that. I, I mean, I, I agree completely with that, that it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge when an activist selectively applies science. And that may be because they're on an ideological mission and it's so important to them that they just have to really go hard on one piece of data and exclude others. And that, that's a dangerous mission. I mean, I, I you know, I, I think that is a problem sometimes in the environmental movement if you're not fact-based or selectively fact-based. I think one way to think about it though, maybe this is a little bit what Jess has said, is that um, sometimes advocates may have an easier time advocating for science where they believe there's receptive, you know, there's some receptivity you know, that's where you can get a win-win. It, you know, it, it, yes, you're gonna make people uncomfortable, but if you can make people feel comfortable with science that actually confirms something that they, that there's broad consensus around, that, that's the more incrementalist approach. It's not that, the, uh, an approach always favored by an advocate who feels this is a make or break moment. I'm not, I'm not compromising. I'm not going with what's easy. I gotta stand really firm on this because it's right. So there are battles, I think, where you have to draw li lines in the sand, but I, I, you know, I think it's dangerous for environmentalists to proceed selectively. I, you know, it's one of the big problems we have with what's going on in our politics right now, that it's not fact-based. And so I, I, don't, I hope we don't contribute to that problem. That's great. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, again, take a little bit of liberty because I'm the moderator to ask a question of my own that I've talked about with Zoe and others. And, and this is an even more interesting question because I'm, I'm so proud to say that Zoe is now on the Adirondack Park Agency Board. Um, and so she's she's in a new level of dealing with these, these questions. But but she and I and Ross and many others participated in a, in a project um, in the last couple of years to try to draft a policy around conservation development for New York that would alter the Adirondack Park Agency Act. It would amend the Adirondack Park Agency Act to require the principles of conservation development um, be applied in certain situations on projects that met uh, particular thresholds. And the details are not important. What is important, I think, is that we approached it in a way that, that we all felt. It was a very broad stakeholder group that included, you know, the environmental organizations, scientists, um, forest industry. You know, we, we tried to take it in a way that was, let's all get together and come to, come to a a draft of what this could look like that that would sort of appease <laughs> a variety of audiences um, and and it was a super interesting process um, but what I find challenging is that we can get it to a certain point it was introduced um, and then it, it, and 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 we thought it was terrific but in the 11th hour there seemed to be sort of last minute things that happen in Albany that are almost outside of anything you could ever ever foresee or do and how and how can you I guess say anything about sort of that the last minute things that happen there that even if you think you've got something that's great even if you think you've approached it in a great way sometimes there are other things that occur just in the way that policy gets made that that's kind of outside our our control and is there anything that we can do to influence that process or maybe that's too hard of a question you want to go first? I feel like I keep going first. You want to take this uh, one? No, I think you should. This is about New York I, and the Adirondacks on some level. So I'd love you to go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's not even necessarily about this issue, which, yeah. you know, um, there was a harrowing effort made on that issue. I actually have not been involved in it, but I've heard about it. Um, the whole 11th hour thing, right? It's the sausage making, right? It's, being in the room when it happens in Hamilton, it's all those things. Um, there is no way to control that. So um, part of the issue is you can have, you know, the best policy you've ever written on paper. Um, and, you know, you kind of put it into this, um, this sausage grinder and there's all these other things in the mix. And, you know, it might be something completely unrelated to the issue you're trying to address. But some of the players overlap enough that they're like, yeah, so if you want to get that bill done, we're going to need you to do X, Y, and Z. So, 
you know, this is where, um, you know, people come out of the woodwork, you know, there are always unanticipated things where, you know, someone has an interest in an issue that you maybe haven't thought of. I've had that happen a million times. And you're like, really, they care about this? Um, and their opinion might be completely, you know, out of, you know, left field from your view because you just didn't see it, but it might be really important to a legislator. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of things that happen where issues get linked together and you're having to manage for something completely unrelated to what you're trying to do. Um, so it is, it's hard when you are trying to put forward a policy on a specific issue, but you have to take it into a process that's um, so focused on kind of the news of the day or, you know, externalities that you have to suddenly manage for. I wouldn't add anything to that. You know, the minute you get into a political process, log rolling and compensatory uh, givebacks and relationships kick in. We, we did a large scale analysis of the Plum Creek development that some of you may have remembered from Maine, which was not a scientific analysis, it was a financial analysis that looked at how much Plum Creek stood to earn from uh, getting approvals for the development. And uh, it showed that they'd make a lot of money and it, put a lot of pressure on them. And our goal was to help the regulatory agent, in this case, the Maine Land Use Regulatory Commission, make an informed decision about, could they get more conservation or are they satisfied with the amount of conservation they got by giving up these development approvals? And the undertone was that, hey, these guys are making a lot of money. You could shake them down for some more conservation. And we thought it was pretty objective, hard-headed analysis and to the last minute, kind of Plum Creek, basically greased a couple of legislators. I wouldn't, I wanna be careful how I say that on the recording, um, but um, you know, there were extraneous 11th hour developments, Michele, just the kind of thing that you talked about. And so, you know, we didn't get, we thought there'd be a much more even handed analysis and incorporation of our analysis, but it became a political process in which there was massaging and trade-offs going on outside of our analysis. And it was a little, it was, it, was, it was unfortunate. And we felt a little bit like I'm sure you felt. And I don't know how you control those things. Ultimately, your analysis should stand on its own. And even if you lost or it didn't get incorporated, it should be respected, modeled, and people should champion it in the future. And that may be a little uh, Panglossian to think in the long run, rationality wins. Uh, but I guess it's what you hope for. Right. Um, I'm going to attempt to bring in some elements of three different questions that I've seen in three different locations. Um, one, I, and try to combine into one question, I probably won't do it very well, but one is just, and, it, and you have already spoken a little bit about this, just um, the extent to which, you know, where would you rank New York State versus other states on, in terms of environmental policy, which is, was, just, was just really interesting. And, and maybe whether or not either of you would like to share um, any information about projects or policies that you're currently working on. I know you just were involved in the Climate Leadership and, and Community Protection Act was, you know, in my, my opinion, is a, is a great New York State achievement. Um, would you like to talk about that or other, other sort of current policy issues or projects that either of your organizations are involved in and, and what, you know, how that places New York versus other, other areas? I'll go first, Jess, to relieve you of the... Uh, so, um, we're working actually with TNC um, and American Forest and the Land Trust Alliance, a group of organizations that are really focused on climate policy uh, in and with a, with a focus on the Climate Alliance, which some of you may know, which is a group of about 25 states um, that is focused on enacting climate oriented policies in keeping with the Paris Accords. And this is the whole focus on states moving forward, even while the federal government is not. And our, and TNC has a little broader focus, but our, our focus is really on sort of nature-based solutions and on land conservation. And how can states begin to incorporate land conservation into the array of tools that they're developing to reduce emissions um, and to help adapt to climate change. So, you know, we've done scans of states. Um, you know, New York State, as you can imagine, is just way in the forefront, at least on paper, and Jess can talk more specifically about it. But what gets enacted, what gets implemented in this pandemic era with few resources is really unclear. There are other states like Massachusetts that are really at the forefront, by which I mean they have 
policies both on the emission side but also on the land side to align with climate. Um, Maine is poised under a new governor to do some very, very exciting things, um, incorporating climate science into their land conservation criteria. Um, and there are even states outside the Climate Alliance like Tennessee that are doing some pretty interesting things. Um, and so we're, we're focused on figuring out where we can be a help to some states. We're developing a white paper with American forests uh, on the role of land conservation in combating climate change. TNC is just doing amazing amounts of work, has released some terrific new materials that I'll try to copy into the chat if, um, uh, for you, Jess, um, that has just been terrific in distilling um, sort of the role of nature in combating climate change. So this is a very concerted effort to focus on states. And I'd say New York is right up there in, on paper. I'm not sure in reality, a state like Massachusetts is just consistently implementing at a very, very high level on all areas related to climate, energy policy, emissions, forest management, land protection. They really are pulling climate through in a very integrated way in that state. Um, Pennsylvania, I mean, I could go on and on, there's, there, but there's a lot of work being done comparing and contrasting and figuring out how to intervene in various states. And TNC's got a really great person up in Massachusetts working on some of this stuff. So that's a little bit what, what, what we're up to. Um, our focus has been a little bit more on working with the land trust, but it inevitably intersects with states. For example, in New Hampshire, we work with a coalition of land trust working on integrating resilience into their land conservation plans. And the state was kind of looking at the whole thing and now the state's kind of jumped in a bit and they're interested in, well, what data and science should we be using and how might we integrate that into our swap plan, for example? It's kind of an indirect way in through the policy, uh, in through the back door. Those are my thoughts. I see that it's, it's one minute to 11, so I'm gonna let Jess have the last word on that question or anything else that you would like to, to share with us because I don't wanna go too far beyond uh, imposing on your time. But Jess, do you wanna to add to that? Um, you know, I, I appreciate all that. I don't know that I wanna add to that with one minute left. Um, I just wanted to appreciate how important this topic is of um, you know, incorporating science into our policy making, um, especially, frankly, with the level of civic discourse that's happening in our country right now. Um, I think the more that we can continue to talk about science in a way that's accessible and understandable to both the public and the policymakers, we will be able to move forward, you know, long term policies on a number of issues that are really important for, you know, our kids and future generations. Um, and so I really appreciate that this was a topic for a panel like this today and wanted to thank you all once again for putting this together. Thank you. Well, it, it is now 11, which forces me to, to close the discussion, although I could stay here and talk about this for a long time. It's been tremendously interesting and, and fun um, to talk to you and nice to see both of you. Thank you so much for joining us and for being, Peter, for being willing to be here at the last minute. We appreciate you rearranging your schedule for that night, and I so appreciate the knowledge um, and insight that you've both shared with us. Um, and thank you to all of you who have attended today, and I, I again want to encourage you to, uh, to register and, and participate in the rest of these webinars that are at the same time on Fridays in October. And this is, is recorded, so if you want to go back to any of this in the future, please feel free to do that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Great job. Thanks, everyone.